The Gatekeeper Jack was full of love and light, that love and light had replaced the fear, anxiety, and need of time gone by for he had finally reached the level to meet the gatekeeper and to make the voyage into the final frontier. He remembered separating from the creator when he was just an ethereal spark. He was guided by his spiritual advisors and mentors where he was to become ready to take the plunge into the physical world where he was to separate his spirit from his self so he could experience his earthly life, reach enlightenment and absorb the wisdom that lay ahead in his future destinies. Right from the start. Even before he had descended for the first time into his personal physical cycles of birth, physical death and rebirth he had been shown the journey that all developing souls must take, so he knew that he was to perfect, then carry all the beauty, harmony and bliss into the light from the offset. His spirit would be nailed to the cross. The Four Elements And imprisoned in the flesh by his wants and desires whilst he was alive in the physical world. His Higher Self which is part of the divine and is a perfect, eternal, all-powerful, conscious and an intelligent being that is his true self, was to remain in spirit sending down messages in the form of precognition, intuition and inspiration while he walked on the earth and in need of help and guidance. Then as he crossed back into spirit after he had been absorbed and integrated back into his soul, after he had recovered and reorientated himself from the life gone by, his soul, higher self, spiritual advisors and mentors help choose his new path for his own spiritual development for his next incarnation. Then after many lives and repetitions, the duality of the two worlds understandings would meld together as he became aware in the physical that his destiny was in his own hands. Through making the right choices in life by using his free will and his spiritual awareness to follow his path. He would shift from selfish love to selfless love leaving all the pain and suffering behind and then he would achieve his predestined goals and with this would come peace, love and true happiness and all the chaos would fall into order as he fulfilled his fate. Of course. If he made the wrong choices, and let's face it, if one is wronged it's easy to want vengeance or justice and bring alive one's darker side. He would be forced to be born again into the pain and suffering until he would rise above his physical nature and selfish desires to find his soul's purpose. However, he knew that he must go through all the hardship and pain and that they were lessons to be learnt and mastered. Once he had reached that level of understanding, he knew that just as he would have crossed over from sentient and then into cognitive beings, he would cross over into the ether in the same way for the final time. From there on he would only return to the physical as a spiritual guide and he and every new soul awaited and welcomed that moment, for although there were still lessons to be learnt in the ether, it was with love and compassion. He remembered the first adventure like as if he was still in the moment, he had worked out a set of paths and destinies with the powers that be and his choice had been made and he was cast into his first physical life. His primordial lives as one-celled living organisms had been intellectually nondescript and on his spiritual return they could only be ascertained as a living experience. Then he became cell-dividing and multi-celled, reproducing organisms that soon became more complex as they developed senses, jaws, backbones, appendages, stomachs and anuses. Eyes, which was like a big bang for evolution, because their eyes sparked off a chain reaction in evolution as they became predators or prey in the food chain and they battled to survive in their hostile world. When he was in spirit he noticed that the blue-green algae were able to use sunshine, water and carbon dioxide to produce carbohydrates and at the same time give the world oxygen. Later, plants in the oceans that drift in the currents just below the surface of the water and flora on the land would form and do the same, making it possible for some of the creatures to leave the oceans behind and live on the land. He chose in spirit to come down and be the cells that through their evolution would become animals and creatures. 
As he spiritually evolved so he physically evolved too, the more complicated the cell structures the more complicated the physical consciousness and soul. From the oceans, to the swamps, to the jungles, to the forests and the plains, he traveled leaping out at death into spirit, then back down he would fall into birth from one creature to the next as his spiritual journey and his genealogical path unfolded. Yes. The pain and fear of being eaten by predators or the confusion and suffering of being cut down by disease. Famine or drought were entwined with the basic pleasures of procreation, nourishment, delousing or just simply bathing in the warmth of the pools or the sun were the sum total of his primary adventures. As his incarnations traversed through the primordial life forms to sentient creatures, he grew both naturally and spiritually. Then, there was a change in his planet's orbit that in turn created a change in his natural environment. With that change there was a response as the brain size of his species grew and he stepped up to another level to cognition and or self-consciousness. Suddenly, survival, love, happiness, contentment, adaptation, curiosity, invention and adventure were his key features and he became an intelligent species with telescopic vision, grasping hands and thumbs and social hunting, learning and defensive skills. He also acquired flexible thinking and the ability to remember his past and imagine and shape his future, which placed his species at the top of the food chain. Jack and the first intelligent tribes lived in the plains where they communicated to each other with their new developed language and they forged weapons and tools from the volcanic glass that lay scattered on the floor pushed up from beneath the earth with the volcanic movement that came with them change in orbit of their planet and their rapidly changing environment. Yes, they developed hunting and fashioning tools and were able to acquire food and build shelter that they were then able to pass on to future generations with their primary language and consciousness. Then, as time went by, they spread out into all directions and Jack lived in a cave near the sea where he fed on scallops and other marine delicacies that lay in his path. The tribes broke apart again like genetic cell division as they grew in number. This was not born out of curiosity and adventure, but out of necessity for food and shelter, because with more of them to be housed and fed, the latter was no longer in abundance, so they broke apart for their own self-survival. Jack and his soul group leapfrogged through their incarnations from tribe to tribe as they spread throughout their natural environment, at first on the plains, then along the coast, then back inland. Yes, they spread from land to land from island to island across the seas and then from continent to continent they colonized their planet until there was no land left in which to settle. Somewhere along the way they had learned how to create and control fire to cook their food and to keep them safe and warm at night. Then the invention of the wheel helped them carry and move heavy objects, they were also able to keep warm with animal skins that they had fashioned into clothes with their tools. They had learned how to construct huts out of stone, mud, grass, leaves and timber and with the discovery of harnessing and irrigating water. The sowing of the seeds of wheat and corn and growing them into crops and the domestication of wild animals that they put in corrals for food they learned to come together as they transformed from nomadic hunter-gatherers into farmers and villagers. The tribes began to exchange goods and trinkets as traders ventured from settlement to settlement as they began to evolve into their own cultures and with the invention of writing. Knowledge could be freed from the memory alone and this took them from mere civilization to sophisticated cities with philosophy, religion and science. It was then that the harmony and peace was shattered as territorial battles, fueled with greed and political ambition began to erupt and they began to wage war on each other like there was no tomorrow. The tribes that spoke the same language and believed in the same gods battled side by side becoming either the conquerors or the conquered. 
At first his post-peaceful lives had been ruthless as he found himself on one side of the barbarism in one life, then on the other side in the next. Although the lives were primitive and seemed to lack any kind of spiritual cohesion, learn he did. For when he eventually pulled out of those dark lives he was much stronger, wiser and complete, for he had been a cave dweller, a slave, a slave owner, a farmer, a fisherman, a craftsman, a tradesman, a salesman, a warrior, a prince, princess, king, queen, a pauper, and many more and his lives had been long, short and mediocre. He had loved and lost his wives when male and husbands when female, along with his parents and siblings when either. Words cannot explain the relief that he felt when in his life the roles took on a more sophisticated stance and the warring died down, or should I say that the consciousnesses of the planet that he was being placed into in his life cycles were becoming more sophisticated in nature. As battles were won and lands were conquered, empires began to rise and fall and the victorious armies who had rose to power. Because of the utilization of their geological setting, location and warrior skills began to meld together on a global level when the precious stones, fuels and metals that they had been all fighting over from millennia to millennia that had boosted their inventors to create new, bigger and better weapons from the club to the nuclear age had pointed out the obvious, that if they did not stop fighting and find world peace it was all going to end in world destruction. As the power had changed hands throughout the eons, the mythologies and trades had begun to evolve and take on a life of their own and it was lovely to see the effects of art, philosophy, mathematics, science, politics, literature, academia, the trades and inventions accompanied by a global ceasefire all branching out into a splendid cultural bloom. It sure made it a marvelous time to be alive on the planet and one could see the difference. It was folklore as well as the thought of doomsday that became the cornerstone toward building a bridge of peace as nations shared their tales of tragedies. Good versus Evil love stories, romantic comedies, mysteries and odysseys, for these fictional scenarios of heroes, villains, victims, lovers and perpetrators all began to move everyone emotionally. With this came a longing to end all war and bring on the freedom, justice and peace of which every being truthfully sought. Jack lived his lives like that of a honeybee in a field abundant with flowers in full bloom in the height of the summer merrily hopping from flower to flower gathering the nectar in which to take home to his hive. His hive being the spiritual paradise in between his physical lives, as he went on his journey. Reorientation, assessment, recalculation and rebirth, although it could be summed up in four words, was a long drawn out process for he had to be precise and lucid throughout the whole procedure right down to the choosing of one's new parents, family, friends, associates and environment. Yes, one had to get the character, skills and disposition right, for they were essential if one was to begin where one left off at the exit of one's last incarnation. He laughed at the times in his physical incarnations when he had cursed his parents at messing up his lives by being irresponsible and abandoning him in their worldly chaos. Not knowing that it was his path that he, the counselors, the masters and his personal guides had set and it was his responsibility to face up to and transcend what stretched out before him. He remembered how he had moved from physical vessel to vessel carrying all the above along with his idiosyncrasies subconscious implants. These were post-hypnotic suggestions that had been placed into his mind in the intermediary state, so that he would recognize and react to key situations. Signs and events that he would either have to evade or connect to in his physical life's plan. And unconscious memories of lives that had already been spent in other times and places within his spirit body just like he had been shown with the crucifixion backslash reincarnation paradox back when he was just an ethereal spark, 
although, actually experiencing it was different from being shown it. He remembered asking one of the spiritual tutors before he had experienced it for himself, why can we not create eternal matter without the paradox? And the tutor looked at him with a wise smile full of love and compassion as he told him that. One cannot create such a reality with all its unique and diverse individual inhabitants and splendor without experiencing it first, for without the fall into ignorance we would all be puppets of the Creator or simply imaginings in its dream. The paradox gives us our own identities that are born out of the experiences that go in through the five senses. Basically you see with your eyes, smell with your nose, hear with your ears, touch or are touched with your skin and taste with your tongue and this separates us from the outside world and our external experiences and we become self-aware. Then the struggle for self-survival against, what at times seems against all odds, gives us our independence and once we truly have it in our hearts and souls our flame becomes eternal and can never be extinguished. He remembered countering by asking, can we not cut out all the selfishness, pain, loss and grief? And the tutor laughed and said, and what rid ourselves of color? You cannot experience responsibility, respect, empathy and altruism for without those things one cannot experience true bliss. If one has not experienced and risen above pain, loss, anguish and despair for all the love and joy that you have now in your young heart will be like a spark in a star when you lift out the paradox and begin to live your life only in spirit. He then gazed deep and compassionately into his mind's eye as he said, you will see my young friend. He then asked, how can we make sense and find our way amidst all that forgetfulness, pain and chaos? And the tutor simply stated the fact that, one's soul is forever changing and growing. For every choice and opportunity that comes your way in spirit and in your physical incarnations will place you into different destinies that are at the same time all enmeshed within one finale, that being spiritual perfection. In a nutshell he said, all paths eventually lead to home. Jack enjoyed the spiritual program and he loved working and living on campus within the intermediate state in between lives. As well as tuition, he enjoyed his spiritual home with his direct spiritual cluster and he also loved all the joy and endless bliss at the spiritual leisure centers, for he took pleasure in every little thing that was in the light. As he ascended spiritually through the levels he began to work on either side of the veil. Within the ether on the campuses there are of course the famed ADC. Booths, after death communication booths, that Jack remembered frequenting after he had reorientated himself just after each crossing when he was in between lives and on the ascendance. The booths were where one was summoned if one was needed in the physical realms to tie up loose ends. Earthbound tragedies and bereaved relatives who were in great need were usually the reason for the calling, the powers that be had assessed the need and sent the alarm if they thought it was needed. Then, there was the shout into the ether as the mental and physical mediums reached out with their abilities on behalf of their clients or circle. With the help of the mediums a lot of work could be done, not just with the aid of direct communication, but also in the form of letting go. Of course, the knowledge that there is no death and personal wisdom of life in the hereafter was also a great healer. On some occasions one had to book and even take time off from work and school on the other side depending on its spiritual worth and depth. It could be a special earth-related anniversary such as a birthday or physical death of one's own past or it could be for those that they had left behind. For example, people's birthdays, marriages, anniversaries, vacations, public holidays or even retirement or they take time out of the rat race and begin to question life's mysteries and purpose. For it is then that they are more prone to feel and be guided with one spiritual presence, although, 
the latter is usually down to their own spirit guides for the booths are generally only used in the first few years after the crossing to help with interdimensional bereavement. Jack remembered using the booths to visit people's dreams when they were in the REM. State, rapid eye movement, where they were fully open and are receptive to spiritual communication and guidance, here he told them that all was well and that they must let go and move on and that he was still alive spiritually. He remembered in one particular life that he had just left behind how he came back spiritually and scattered angel dust down his bereaved wife's spine as she placed flowers on his grave on the anniversary of his physical transition. He remembered how she looked up and called out his name with an inner knowing and as she did so he scattered the angel dust down her spine once more. He loved to watch her pleasure as the goose bumps rose along with her fine hairs on her bare arms and at the same time he loved to watch as she relished within the warmth that was emanating from her heart and soul, if only for a moment. He also remembered leaving her a single white carnation each valentine in the restaurant that she still frequented after his death, an apport was difficult to perform and one also had to have permission from the masters, so as they did not upset the natural order of things. He could feel her reaching out with her mind, although it was sorrowful it was all-encompassing and uplifting, for as she ritualistically ate their one-time annual meal as a tribute to their eternal love, it was as if he was there physically too. She never questioned the appearance of the flower, she just placed it in her suitcase full of memorabilia at the end of the evening with the rest, I suppose she just put it down to another uncanny coincidence. He would also from time to time leave one on her car windscreen where one would usually find a parking ticket. He remembered the joy that lit up her countenance as she found one on her birthday, seemingly posted through the letterbox. She did not know if she had a secret admirer or if all these coincidences were in fact paranormal. She knew it was the kind of thing that he used to do when he was alive just to let her know that he would never take her for granted and that he still cared, but she was a skeptic at heart and although she would wish to feel he was somehow alive she could not quite break the mold. She would eventually romanticize, although in secret, that they were not coincidences after all and that they were signs that not even in death were they truly apart and he was there watching and waiting. Basically, Jack and the visiting spirits used the booths to help themselves and the earthbound inhabitants along with their bereavement and spiritual growth. Although on the surface it all looked like acts of free will and interpersonal spiritual development, it was all orchestrated by the powers that be and then in turn inspired by the muses, as was everything in both the spiritual state and the physical realms of existence. Not that everything is determined either its interplay in and between the both, you know, like jazz musicians at a concert that play in order, at will, and in spiritual inspiration. When someone that was left behind was nearing their turn to make their transition into the light, one was summoned to the way stations which housed the portals, that the spirits used to communicate. Here, they would then guide the newly departed souls into the light, after that, once they had been successfully helped to cross over, they were introduced to the elders for their life's review and then to the institutions for care and orientation. Once they had regained their lucidity and spiritual perspective and they were once again absorbed and integrated within the light. There was a lot of spiritual work to be done and a great deal of it was done in the Hall of Records, for it is in the Hall of Records where one is able to look at history past, future, and present. Jack remembered leaving the Hall of Records and taking the outcomes into the simulation booths where he would download the information and then run himself through the chosen karmic programs searching for answers. In the simulation booth, he was able to act out personal roles of past life events along with the ability to possess varying bodies and see the dramas unfold from alternative perspectives. Although the past life events were reviewed at the end of each physical journey with the Council of Elders, he was able to stop, fast forward and rewind as well as take his time at any given event and moment, 
which brought about hidden depths and untapped wisdom. He would also run through potential destinies in the next stages of his personal development by regarding outcomes of possible lives and future events like he did with the past. Then once he had gathered enough experience from the possible futures, he would weigh and measure it against nature's laws of chaos and order. When it seemed like there was no further that he could take it on his own, he would pay a visit to the masters, they could then mark and advise upon the hypothetical paths that he had calculated and chosen, who in turn would pass it on to the elders for further scrutiny and inspection. Life in the light's middle upper levels where a great majority of the Ethereans end up was pretty much the same as the physical life in the physical dimensions. Although it is in a subtler dimension, the spirits worked, studied, played and rested and everything was free, there was no monetary system, everything functioned with love and compassion and it also had its diverse spiritual utilities. There are many levels in the light and where you end up all depends on your mental state at the time of the crossing. It is also relevant to the life that you have just led on the physical planes of existence, and of course the knowledge that you had gained while you were there. You have the sub-subs, which is where the dark forces lay and this is full of twisted demonic souls and when normal everyday souls arrive there they are transformed into demonic gargoyle-like creatures where they party. They are consumed in the dark arts and sadistic pleasures that can only be associated with hell, they live in a semi-sleep state and inflict pain on each other and themselves. It is where the demonic cult followers and participants reside after their physical incarnations. Along with the interdimensional hateful and sadistic entities that also dwell there that can be summoned on a subtle level to the physical planes by demonic rituals and invocations where they cause havoc and destruction on the living until they are forced back by rituals of the light by priests or mediums. The subs are more or less the same but without the interdimensional demons and they play hellish twisted games for their pleasure. No one has any attention span and all they can think about, or partake in is sex, heavy drinking, drugs and violence, it is where the selfish and narcissistic souls go, along with the addicts, the devious, liars, cheats and gangsters. They are also in a semi-sleep state controlled and contorted by their endless wants, needs and desires. The Winter Land is a land of dogma and logic, caught up in their selfish worlds of ignorance and arrogance, they eventually wake up to the fact that they are living in an illusion and it is then that they seek help from the guides to go up the levels. The Summerland is where the happy people go and they are optimistic, social and awake. They partake in light alcoholic beverages and social pleasures and they are on the borderline with the intermediary level which is where the spiritual souls go who have opened themselves up to the spiritual side of life and are not blinded or weighed down by dogma or arrogance. These souls are truly loving and happy-go-lucky, they live a joyful life of spiritual freedom and they are fully aware of themselves and others that surround them. The upper is where the souls go who possess the same qualities as the intermediary, but they also have unconditional love, empathy, tolerance and compassion which the lower levels do not have. They are not judgmental and are open-minded and free, when they party they meditate and reach higher levels of consciousness preparing themselves for the upper upper. Then, last but not least is the upper upper and these souls have all the best qualities that a soul could want and they live life accordingly. They are the closest to God and its angels, they let go and partake in practices of spiritual freedom in their spiritual retreats and social gatherings and they lose their bipedal forms to become loving, glowing orbs of ethereal light. Finally, after that, it was rumored that you left the light to become a god in the void, but that was only speculation because they could only guess at where the highest of high spirits went to after they seemingly disappeared from, or vacated the light. The spiritual levels are not a hierarchy of souls, they are specifically structured to help one evolve spiritually by utilizing one's environment with one's personal wants, needs and beliefs. 
Most souls go to the intermediary at their crossing because this level is relative to the physical dimensions, then after they have orientated themselves with their spiritual status they are placed into a level that is on par with their spiritual stage or development. One can progress up through the levels when spiritual and personal work is achieved, either through reincarnation or by staying in spirit and progressing. With the latter, for instance, if you have problems relating with others then you will find yourself in the lower levels, say like the winter land where everything revolves around you, so that you can get accustomed to living with others and be happy in content. Once you are ready to progress and you are ready for spiritual slash social interaction, then you will be lifted up out of the lower level to a level that is apt for your spiritual development or evolution. The physical dimensions are the best way to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Because to be reborn into the physical dimensions and evolve naturally one can climb the spiritual ladder that is in accordance with one's new enhanced personality from the progressive work that one has achieved while one was down there. This is how most of the souls lift up through the levels. Because in the physical planes all the levels are present and one is able to recognize growth and spiritual development by being attracted to them as opposed to the spiritual levels where they are made up of divisions which are in accordance to one spiritual development. Of course, spiritual enlightenment can be achieved on both planes of existence, but on the physical planes it can be achieved faster because of its spiritual diversity. Further, on the physical planes as one evolves, one is able to receive the wisdom that is passed down to them from the guides via the higher self for their spiritual progression. Basically, the guides live their lives in the higher planes of the light where they live a life of work, study, and leisure and when they apply their service to humanity they enter the conduit, which is the gateway between heaven and earth and they joyfully perform their service with absolute pleasure. The higher self receives them, then passes on those messages into the subconscious and intuitive mind of their charge and the charge nurtures those seeds with the dutiful act of meditation and contemplation. Which brings about the growth, change and wisdom which helps the charge to progress along the path towards spiritual harmony and perfection.